to the University of Texas Energy Symposium for January 30th, 2024. I'm Carrie King, a research scientist and assistant director here at the Energy Institute that sponsors the Energy Symposium. Uh, before I introduce today's speaker, I will highlight the talks that are upcoming. Next week, we will have Kyrie Baker, who is a professor at the University of Colorado Boulder. She will be talking about uh, the electricity grid and the smart grid kind of configuration uh, and trying to understand, <clears throat> uh, giving your talk, reducing grid emissions with a software upgrade. So what can we do about using the grid smarter? Week after that, February 13th, we will have a talk on nuclear energy from Janzi Kandasami uh, from Idaho National Labs. But today, uh, it's a pleasure to have uh, Jamie Van Nostrand, uh, who is going to give us a talk about his book. He's the uh, former Charles M. Love Jr. Endowed Professor at the West Virginia University College of Law. A little background on Jamie. Uh, before transitioning to law school teaching at the West Virginia, uh, he spent three years as executive director at the Pace Energy and Climate Center in White Plains, New York, uh, previously practicing uh, in a private law practice as a partner in the energy and environmental practice groups of two law firms in the Pacific Northwest, Perkins Coy and Stoll Reeves. <clears throat> uh, March 2023, Governor Mara Healy, Massachusetts, appointed uh, Jamie Van Nostrand to be chair of the Massachusetts Department of Public Utilities, effective on May of 2023. He received his LLM degree or Master's of uh, of Law before LLMs were cool from artificial intelligence. Uh, he has a Juris JD from University of Iowa College of Law, Master's degree in Economics from SUNY at Albany, and an undergraduate degree in Economics from University of Northern Iowa. So his talk today will be, yes, about his book, The Cold Trap, How West Virginia Was Left Behind, and the Clean Energy Revolution. The book came out in 2022. Uh, examines a relatively recent history of West Virginia from 2009. So he will discuss the context of the politics and the grid transformations and the role of coal uh, and the politics in West Virginia. And as he concludes here at the end of his abstract, the mountain state now faces overwhelming obstacles competing the economic marketplace, 21st century. And he says the book serves as a warning of how a fair energy transition can be derailed by political failure. So with that said, I will now hand it over to Jamie. So Jamie, go ahead and share your screen. Uh, and as always, please submit your questions uh, via the question and answer feature of Zoom or on YouTube. And I will look to try to interject these to Jamie as he speaks. And if not, I'll ask them at the end of his talk. With that said, uh, Jamie, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Carrie. Really appreciate the introduction. Really appreciate the opportunity to, to talk to the folks today at the University of Texas Energy Institute. Um, it's a really great to, time to be in the energy business. I've, I've been on the job, as, as Carrie mentioned. Um, I was appointed chair of the Massachusetts Commission back and took office in May. So I've been on the job about nine months. Um, and it's uh, really interesting times in, in the energy business. Lots of decarbonization going on. Um, we'll talk primarily today about about my book and sort of what happened in, in West Virginia. I was a professor there from 2011 to 2023. Um, and then sort of I can draw the contrast in terms of what it was what um, what it was like in in West Virginia versus uh, what it's like and the, and the clean energy issues in in Massachusetts today, but mostly be talking about about the book. Um, so a little bit, I want to just provide some, so there's the, the, the cover of the book. It's uh, Cambridge University Press, came out in July of 2022. It's available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, you name it. There's there's a link to a website. You can also order it there. So it was, I kind of, um, it just it's based on the experience of, of teaching at W College of Law. I also ran a Center for Energy and Sustainable, Sustainable Development when I got there in July of 2011. The dean of the law school had this vision that we should we're going to be an extraction state west virginia is always going to be an extraction state but can we have a, a voice can we provide a forum where we can debate um sort of economic development extraction whether and versus environmental protection some of the things that we can do to to have a better um less environmental impact while we continue to extract so 
Uh, so these are the lessons learned, I guess, over the 12 years I was there. So I want to start off just giving a little bit of the energy profile of West Virginia. Then, as Carrie mentioned, the um, the book is, I talk about the lost decade. It's primarily those years between 2009 and 2019. Then in terms of policies, just um, the absence of policies in the state that promote clean energy, and then some policies in place that continue the, the commitment to coal, and then some I said, I guess be basically a glimmer of hope. There's been some positive developments the last few years, the way forward. So we'll talk a little bit about that. So first with the energy profile, um, West Virginia has, has, has long been one of the leading energy producing states in the country, primarily coal. Um, so six percent of the nation's total is the rank, rank fifth among the states in terms of total energy production. And the electricity supply in West Virginia is very, very heavily weighted towards coal as of 2022 was 89%. Um, renewable energy resources, very minimal. It's hydroelectric power. And there are some, there's about six or 650 megawatts of, of wind turbines in the state. So there is some wind energy um, and some natural gas. One of the things I'll talk about is even though West Virginia is primarily sitting on top of the large, large part of the western half of the state is sitting on top of the Marcellus Shale, which is one of the leading shale gas plays in the country. There really has not been much movement towards new, using natural gas to generate electricity. It's it's all about the coal in West Virginia, as we'll, as we'll talk about. Coal production, so West Virginia is behind only Wyoming. 14% um, of U.S. total coal production from West Virginia. Um, and then third largest reserve base in terms of the recoverable coal reserves. Wyoming is number one. The Illinois coal basin is, is number two. And then natural gas production, fourth in the nation in terms of natural gas, and that is really the Marcellus Shale. It underlies a lot of the western part of the state. And then it's also next to the Utica Shale, which is another shale play that's actually a little bit deeper than the Marcellus Shale, but just massive amounts of natural gas extracted in West Virginia beginning 2010, 2011. Um, so it's basically made it fourth in the state of natural gas. And and all that growth has been um, from the horizontal drilling, basically the un unconventional drilling. So 95% of that um, from shale wells, that growth from 2010 to 2022. So a little bit about sort of the decline in the demand for coal. So these um, this basically measures the, the capacity factor. You might be, might, le might be learning about that in, in your energy classes. It, at UT, but it's it's basically how often do the do the coal plants run, and so you can see uh, the the extent to which the coal plants have been running less later on in the year. We'll be talking about so how how did that happen? Mostly because of the natural gas, the cheap and plentiful sources of natural gas, and some of the developments in in natural in combined cycle combustion turbines that really pushed down wholesale prices and pushed the West Virginia coal plants um, out of the money. This is a little bit of context because um, one of the things that I'll, that I'll talk about is is um, the, the the coal trap. The title of the book. Well, one of one of the elements of that is just it's coal is a source of great pride in the state. It's it's built it's it's embedded into the culture. It's integrated into the culture, and you can see um, so some of the takeaways in this chart that shows coal production since 1900. The, the number of coal miners peaked in 1940 at 130,000 coal miners, while the production um, in terms of millions of tons peaked in 1997 at 181 million tons. As we'll see in the next slide, we're down to fewer than 12,000 coal miners in the state in recent years. A little bit of a bump up in 2022 when natural gas prices bumped up a little bit. But so a few takeaways here in terms of you can see how dominant the coal industry was in terms of employment for, for a lot of the state's history. And that 130,000 employment back in 1940, that's largely underground coal miners before we had the continuous miners. And so it just took a lot of bodies to mine a lot of coal. And then later on, um, we started seeing mechanization, the continuous miners. And so the production would go up the number of, of coal miners employed went down. So that's why you see those production numbers going up to 181 million in 1997, but you only have 18,000 coal miners employed. So you don't have the continuous miners in terms of underground production, but you also have mountaintop removal, which is the um, probably the most efficient way of 
of uh, mining for coal in terms of the number of employees that it takes. So, um, so like I said, a large role in terms of the of the economy in West Virginia, but in terms of the number of miners employed, um, decline very rapidly once once mechanization took place. And this this plays into the book in a couple of different respects. Um, one. Um, one of the things we learned about in writing the book was a little bit of the political history of West Virginia. Um, Senator Joe Manchin will talk about how quickly the state went from from blue to red, right? Probably more more quickly than any other state in the country. When Joe Manchin first was elected in 1996 to statewide office, the state was two to one Democratic, and as of February, I believe, of 2022. That number finally flipped. Now the Republican registrations exceed the Democratic registrations, um, and a lot of that has to do with it can be explained by what's on this on this slide in terms of one you just had fewer miners. As long as the United Mine Workers were were the unions that representing the miners, um, that those are pretty pretty reliable Democratic votes. That's the, that's labor. It's just good labor, and the mine and the UNW would turn out the miners to vote. Vote Democratic. So you see the decline in just the number of miners um, in recent years, in the last four or five decades. The other piece of it is is union is is just fewer union represented mines. Um, one of the things talked about in in the book, not so much because it didn't really happen in the period I was exploring. But um, Don Blankenship, who you might know, Massey Energy, he just announced he's running for the U.S. Senate since Manchin's not running for re-election. So it's going to be. Uh, potentially Don Blankenship um, of Massey Energy running against Jim Justice, the current governor of West Virginia. So you have a couple of coal barons facing off for that Senate seat that um, Manchin is vacating. But man, Blankenship basically had a policy of buying them union mines, closing them, and then reopening them as non-union mines. And so United Mine Workers lost a lot of influence, like I say, both in terms of the just fewer miners generally, but then a lot of the miners that were working in the mines were non-union mines, thanks to Don Blankenship and some of the other coal operators who were really focused on, on taking the, the unions out of the equation. So that left a big hole. And then we'll, one thing I talk about in the book is 2001, you had um, kind of a recognition by the coal industry in, in West Virginia that, gee, we're employing a lot fewer miners because we're blowing off the tops of mountains to get the, get the coal. And two, the environmental carnage that we are creating is much greater. So they focused on what can we do to improve our image? So they came up with this very ingenious marketing strategy called the Friends of Coal, but it was largely driven by the fact fewer miners, more environmental, more environmental harms. And so the Friends of Coal largely filled that vacuum that was left by the decline in the influence of the of the United Mine Workers. And it it explains, it helps explain that that flip from being a heavily Democratic state in 1996 to a very heavily Republican state by the time 2016 and 2018, when you have uh, Donald Trump carrying the state with like 68 percent, 68 percent of the votes. It's a very heavily Republican state right now. I believe the House of Delegates in West Virginia is 88 Republicans and and 12, 12 Democrats. So it would have been a steep uphill climb for Manchin to get reelected this year, when he was elected in 2018, um, he defeated Patrick Morrissey, the current state attorney general, by only 18,000 votes. And Jim Justice is a very popular Republican governor, so it would have been an uphill climb for Manchin to get to get reelected. Um, here's a, a slide that shows sort of what the numbers are as more recently. So we're looking at the total number of employees being, you know, around fewer than 12,000. It's around between 12,000 and 13,000 as of. 2022. So the, the numbers are way down. So the influence of the coal industry is is very much lower than it than it than it has been in, in its history, frankly. And the production is still is still fairly low, about 90 million tons versus that 191 million it peaked in in uh, in 1996 or 97. So the lost decade, um, as I mentioned, that was kind of the working title of the book as I was writing it. Um, I got to I got to West Virginia in 2011. And um, the very first conference I presented when as the director of the energies, I we opened the Center for Energy Sustainable Development. The very first conference we presented in October 2011, Joe Manchin was my was my keynote speaker, and we were looking at the regulation of of shale of shale extraction. It was a it was a big deal in terms of you have the 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 hydraulic fracturing and then you have the horizontal drilling, and the regulations were all geared towards the conventional 
gas wells. And so um, right around 2007, 2008, 2009 is when the Marcellus shale play really started cranking up. Um, and so, and the regulators were trying to catch up. So our first conference in October, 2011 was, was ex looking at those dynamics, the economic opportunity associated with, with shale gas extraction, plus the environmental regulators trying to catch up to it basically. But the big deal in terms of what did that mean for the state was just massive amounts of fairly inexpensive natural gas. It was a, the term is overused, a game changer, but in this case, it really was a game changer in terms of um, changing the economics of electricity production. And coal rapidly fell out of the money because um, you not only had massive amounts of natural gas being extracted, you also had some improvements in combined cycle combustion turbine technology that was being used to generate electricity from natural gas. And West Virginia is part of the PJM um, wholesale market, serves 13 states and, and the District of Columbia. Um, and wholesale prices started dropping dramatically because of cheap fuel prices, cheap natural gas, and improved technology. So um, if you're familiar with, I mean, much you've talked about the horror, about the competitive wholesale markets, they are very competitive. But basically, um, well, basically, power plant operators will bid will bid their projects in according to the marginal cost of generating electricity. And frankly, coal was just out of the money. So if they're at their control room there in Valley Forge, Pennsylvania, they're dispatching power plants until supply equals demand. That's called a market clearing price. If you're below that market clearing price, you're in the money. If you're above the market clearing price, you're out of the money. And thanks to cheap natural gas and improvements in combined cycle uh, technology, coal was out of the money a lot. Um, so that's one of the things that that that's the primary cause of the demise of the of the coal of the coal industry. It's just out of the money and generating electricity. Um, the second bullet point is well, even though. Pretty much anybody who knew much about energy economics knew that was the case. The West Virginia politicians um, chose, chose to blame it all on Obama. And so we had this in 2011 on pretty much every every federal office seeker was blaming. It was all about the war on coal. Um, blame it all on Washington, D.C., Obama's job killing EPA, high Interstate 79, which runs up and down in West Virginia. Lots of billboards. Welcome to, welcome to Obama's no job zone. It was all about the environmental regulations because um, we did have the clean power plan that was proposed by Obama in 2015 and adopted in 2016. Of course, it never actually took effect because it was um, was was ultimately stayed, so it never actually took effect. But it was it was easy for the coal industry to basically say it was all the EPA's problem that if the EPA would just leave us alone. Um, things would be fine in West Virginia. And that was that was really the the narrative. That was the mantra of everybody running for office. That was one thing that was bipartisan, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat in West Virginia, you blamed it all on Washington, DC. And that was one of the one of the drivers that that compelled me to write this book was I I saw it as a huge cop out that and Joe Manchin knew better and and knows better today in terms of um, what was really driving the demise of the coal industry? It was it was natural gas. But instead of stepping up and and helping manage the state through through that transition, let's just blame it all on Washington Washington D.C. And one of the things I I point out in the book is there are a couple of examples of what real political leadership looks like. And the one ex example I gave was uh, in Kentucky, you had a governor Steve Bashir who was a Democrat. His his son Andy is the is, was the governor. Of, um, I guess he's not the governor now. Um, and then Hal Rogers, a Republican congressman who was chair of the Appropriations Committee, together they created what's called Shaping Our Appalachian Region or SOAR, and they kicked that off in 2012. And they pretty much said coal as coal mining as we know it in Eastern Kentucky is over recognizing the impact of the shale gas revolution. We need to figure out a new future for Eastern Kentucky. And so the, the SOAR project, is a, a, it's, a, it's a huge event every year. It's been going on for 12 years now, but that's what leadership looks like. Another example I gave was, was Pittsburgh. When I was teaching at WVU in Morgantown, I lived for several years in Pittsburgh in the 90s. 
you had very uh, courageous civic leadership that recognized steel and coal were over, and they pretty much reinvented Pittsburgh to where it's where it's high tech, it's it's um, healthcare and it's institutions. You got Carnegie Mellon University of Pittsburgh, Duquesne, uh, but they stepped up and they acknowledged that the future is not in coal and steel, and they transformed that community. But in West Virginia, it was all about blaming it on Washington D.C., and so there was no no discussion of a transition, no political leaders stepping up and managing the transition. Let's just blame it all on Washington, D.C. That was a lot of the early part of the lost decade. Later on in the in the lost decade, you actually had wind and solar prices coming down. I, and I talked in the book about wind prices down about 70% during that period, solar prices being down about 90% during that period. And so utilities by the end of the lost decade, if they issue an RFP for new new capacity, most utilities around the country were finding that new wind or new solar, even coupled with battery storage technology, is going to be cheaper than running an existing coal plant. And so that was an additional cause, the demise, the demise of, the, of the coal industry. But there's been some pretty good work done in terms of analyzing what are the reasons for the decline of the coal industry. Number one was fracking, the, the shale gas revolution. Number two was but probably um, renewables, wind and solar. And obviously you have um, international concerns about climate change, so the coal exports decline. And last, number four on the list was EPA regulations, because frankly, EPA regulations that just did not have that much to do with it, even though politicians in West Virginia spent a decade blaming it all on, on the EPA. The other thing that happened in the last decade that I spend quite a bit of time about um, Given all those years that I that I spent in the utility regulatory field, I, I started off the New York Public Service Commission from 80 to 85, and then I represented investor-owned utilities out in the Northwest, as, as Kerry mentioned. Um, so I, I kind of know how the rate-making thing works. One of the things was a, that was pretty amazing, what, what the West Virginia Public Service Commission did during that period was was basically approved the transfer of coal plants that were formerly in the merchant subsidiaries. There's two major utilities that operate in West Virginia, American Electric Power or AEP and First Energy. They both had competitive subsidiaries that would just would operate and compete in the wholesale markets. Um, the rate payers would not bear the losses if they lost money. The rate payers would not gain the profits if they made money. It all went to the shareholders. So it was called merchant plants. Well, once the shale gas revolution started and wholesale prices started dropping and coal plants fell out of the money, both AEP and First Energy said, we need to get out of the merchant generation business. We download these coal plants. What are we going to do with them? West Virginia, they put them into the regulated rate base. And so basically the losses that previously were borne by the shareholders got pushed over to the rate payers. Um, and the West Virginia Public Service Commission approved three of those coal plant transfers between 2012 and 2013. 14. So that contributed. So basically, most states were fleeing coal plants because they were out of the money and you could, you could build new natural gas. Um, they were selling coal plants for pennies on the dollar. In West Virginia, they were actually moving them from, from merchant competitive subsidiaries into the regulated rate base to, to put those losses onto the rate payers. Um, and all the, all the states that I practiced in front of, I, 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 I'm just, a, I mean, I, I didn't mention my. I grew up as the son of a regulator. My my father was chairman of the Iowa Commerce Commission, now the Iowa Utilities Board. Growing up, and so I've kind of been a regulatory wonk my entire um, post law school career. And it's just it's um, it, it's it's really remarkable that that the the PSC did what they did in West Virginia. It contributed to pretty massive rate increases because, like I say, most states. We're taking advantage of cheap natural gas at the start of the lost decade. They were taking advantage of wind and solar at the end of the lost decade in West Virginia. They doubled down on coal and actually moved um, moved plants over from from the merchant subsidiaries. And what that does is is that takes away pretty much any headroom that the utilities might have had to take advantage of natural gas. They're sitting on top of the Marcellus Shale play. Yet no utility in West Virginia invested in natural gas. No new natural gas plants double down on coal, no room for renewables or wind or wind and solar because you're 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 using more more coal. The other big thing I wrote about in the book is the role of energy efficiency um, in terms of giving customers the tools to manage their energy costs by through energy efficiency programs, rebates on on uh, energy efficient appliances, um, 
grants towards insulation, um, rebates towards heat pumps, the kind of things that you do to encourage less, less electricity usage. Um, First Energy literally has no energy efficiency program and AEP has a very, very small energy efficiency program. So the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy, ACEEE, does a state scorecard every year that looks at the, at the, the record of states on energy efficiency. West Virginia was pretty consistently 46, 47, and 48 all, all throughout the last decade. So um, not much interest in promoting energy efficiency when you're when you want to when you have all these all this coal that needs to be generating all this electricity that needs to be used. The other thing when I got to the state I learned was there's really no state state policies promoting clean energy. There's no renewable portfolio standard or a clean energy standard. I mean, a lot of states have a renewable portfolio standard. Now they're moving to a clean energy standard, but it's basically telling the utilities you will generate a certain percentage of your electricity from renewables, or in the case of the clean energy, it needs to be non-carbon. Um, there were none of those policies in place. West Virginia actually had a alternative renewable energy portfolio standard that was actually enacted while Manchin was governor in 2009. It was a complete joke because basically combined or supercritical coal plants were defined as alternative energy. So once that standard was enacted, basically it was already satisfied because vast majority of the electricity generated in West Virginia was from a supercritical coal plant that counted as alternative energy. So there, while there was technically an RPS in place, it was completely worthless. Um, the other piece is there's no energy efficiency resource standard. Um, many states will have a, a standard in place that require utilities to scale up their energy efficiency programs to achieve a certain level of savings. Again, ramping up the programs to help customers manage their energy bills, nothing like that in West Virginia. And no rigorous integrated resource planning process. One of the things I, I did when I first got to the state was where, where do we where do we start here in terms of integrating clean energy and promoting energy efficiency and renewables? Let's work on integrated resource planning. So there's actually a bill that was passed in 2014 that requires the utilities to file integrated resource plans every every five years. Um, maybe I mean step back a little bit and tell you what integrated resource plans are. It basically requires utilities to consider demand side and supply side resources on an equal and consistent basis. So when a utility has a resource gap, it does some planning. It figures out what what kind of load growth are we going to have, what how much how much um, how much load do we need to serve, and then what is our resource base. And you identify well we need we need five we're five hundred megawatts short by in twenty year twenty twenty eight or something. So then you figure okay what is the cheapest way of filling that supply gap you look at conservation you look at energy efficiency you look at demand response on the on the demand side and on the supply side you look at coal and natural gas and wind and solar and nuclear all the basic generation resources and then you you pick the portfolio of resources including both demand side and supply side that meets that fills that supply gap at the lowest cost to rate pairs well, there really wasn't a, a there really was not a rigorous process like that in West Virginia, which is, explains why energy efficiency plays such a small part. Because if you have energy efficiency, that is actually the lowest cost resource, um, much cheaper than than building anything new. But without a without a rigorous integrated resource planning process, um, there was really no you. And it also it was one of the reasons why the utilities did not move to natural gas, even though they're sitting on top of the Marcellus Shale, was that it was all about it's all about run, burning more coal. And so there really wasn't a, a, a close examination by the regulator to see are you on the lowest cost path in terms of of how you're producing energy. Let me see if I've got um, any questions here. Yeah, there was one. Um, question that you yeah, I think you touched on it, but I might ask you just to kind of reiterate or expand and. It's a question is roughly how do you uh, explain why no one, no merchant generators built new natural gas generation, or at least not much, you can tell us, in West Virginia, um, I, because of the cheap sales supply. It was just, go ahead. I talked about it. Yeah, this is from Cameron Andrews about why the merchant generators did not build new nat new gas generation. Um, they tried. Um, I, one of the things I talked about in the book was the, the Dorn brothers um, actually tried to build three um, combined cycle combustion turbines, taking advantage of that combustion turbine technology. There were merchant plants taking advantage of the of the cheap and plentiful natural gas coming from the Marcellus Shale play <clears throat> and the, the technolo technological breakthroughs with combined cycle combustion turbines. Um, and they were basically thwarted. Um, 
The Public Service Commission, I got to say, stepped up. They had to get they had to get certificates of convenience and necessity. The Public Service Commission stepped up and granted certificates authorizing the construction. And then um, Bob Murray of Murray Energy, which was a big operator, coal operator, mostly out of Ohio, um, formed a, I guess they call it an AstroTurf group. And it seemed to be a grassroots group, but it was basically, um, they intervened in, in some of the air permitting cases and opposed the natural gas plants on account of greenhouse gas emissions. And everybody knew it was a complete fraud. The, the, the legal fees, I believe, were even paid for by by Murray Energy, but bottom line, the, the Dorn brothers could not get the approvals necessary, the clean air permits, um, in order to get those. It was $2.1 billion. Three pretty large combined cycle combustion turbines were proposed, and they did not get built. And I got to say, um, Governor Justice was not a big, I, I mentioned this in the book as well, um, he was not a big proponent of he's, he's I mean, Justice made all his money in, in coal, so he'd made a, some remarks suggesting he was not particularly in favor of these natural gas plants, as they would have resulted in coal plants closing down. Why? Because they could generate electricity more, more cheaply. They would have been in the money at PGM, and it would have forced more coal plants out of the money. So um, I, so the an short answer to the question is they certainly tried, and they, they failed because there's just no appetite in West Virginia for for anything other than coal, even like even though, like I say, they're sitting on top of the Marcellus Shale. They're not an energy state; they're a coal state. And that, and the experience of the Dorns in trying to build those three plants pretty much illustrates that because they were taking advantage of the cheap natural gas. West Virginia would have gotten a lot of uh, severance tax revenues from that natural gas that was extracted. It was all about all about the coal. Let's see if I can get the next slide here. Um, so we we talked about um, the. Uh, the percentage of electricity generated from coal actually increased to 91% in 2021. I think the earlier slide I showed you is down to 88% in 2022. Um, but it actually increased during this period, largely because you have those three coal plants moving over from the unregulated rate-based uh, operation to the regulated. And then a, a good example is um, we, had, we had cases for both utilities, I'm thinking of AEP in particular, American Electric Power, they had a case in front of the commission where we need to spend $448 million for these environmental compliance costs to enable these plants to continue operating after 2028. So they filed these cases in front of the PSC, and there was one power plant in particular, a coal plant, the Mitchell plant in the, in the northern panhandle of West Virginia. AEP's own testimony said that rate payers will be better off by $27 million a year if we close down this plant and replace the power with market purchases or purchases from other utilities or purchases from wind and solar. Rate payers are better off by 27 million, but we'll leave it up to the PSC to decide whether you want us to make these expenditures. The PSC said, yeah, we want you to make the expenditures. In fact, we're ordering you to make all necessary expenditures for all three plants, the Mitchell, the Amos, and the Mountaineer plants. So, so those plants will remain operating through 2040. And they've even, they've even asked for that. Um, but that's what that's what they got. Let's make it perfectly clear. You will operate. You will do whatever it takes to keep those plants running through through 2040. The other thing that's happened more recently, I didn't I didn't talk about it much in my book because it happened after the I was largely done with the book. But beginning in September of 2021, the utilities would 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 make annual filings, and most states have a fuel adjustment clause mechanism. But it's basically to update rates to reflect what your fuel costs are going to be. So these annual filings. So beginning in the fall of 2021, the utilities came in and said, well, we need to update our power costs to reflect what we think power costs are going to be for the next 12 months and to true up what our power costs have been for the last 12 months compared to what we projected them to be. And the capacity factors were low in those fines. The regulators, the commissioner said, why are your, why are your coal plants running so less? You've got historical capacity factors. Capacity factors is just a percentage of how much the plan is running versus if you ran it all the, all the time. So a 45% capacity factor indicates you're running at less than half the time. So the, the regulators, the commission started asking questions, why are your capacity factors so low? Um, both AEP and First Energy says, because there's cheaper power available on the market. We're backing down the coal plants to be able to displace them with market purchases or maybe power purchase agreements with neighboring utilities. Maybe we're going to buy wind and solar, but we're taking advantage of cheaper resources on the market. And the PSC said, stop doing that. We want you to continue to burn. We want you to continue to run the coal plants at their historical capacity factors, regardless of the availability of 
cheaper power resources. And, and that caused a lot of head scratching at both AEP and First Energy because it really was, they asked, you know, they filed motions for reconsideration. Let me, let's make sure we understand this. You're telling us to no longer operate our power supply resource portfolio in a manner that minimizes costs for customers. You just want us to run coal. And the commissioner said, yes, that's exactly right. And so that's the way it's, that's the way it's still going. And we'll talk about sort of the impact of that. So these are some of the of the key players shaping Western News energy policies up on the upper left, that's Senator Joe Manchin. Um, those are a couple of the commissioners there. They're now my colleagues now, since we're all commissioners together. So I can't, I'm not going to say much about them. And, um, but they're, they're, um, let's just say they have more pro coal policies than we would ever tolerate in the Commonwealth of, of Massachusetts. The Mountain Valley pipeline is very, is very famous because that's the, the pipeline that was basically Manchin traded that for his 50th vote, getting that Inflation Reduction Act through um, basically the Mountain Valley pipeline had been stopped two or three times by Fourth Circuit rulings, which says the developers equi, equi, um, equitransportation um, were not basically complying with the Clean Water Act or the Endangered Species Act and the forest permits under which they're going to cross them on forests or the Jefferson forests were were um, in not complying with compliance with the law. Um, and basically that ended up getting approved as part of the in June of 2023, the Fiscal Responsibility Act when they raised the debt ceiling. Both the House and the Senate and President Biden signed it that basically said doesn't matter what um, EPA, the Forest Service, um, says about the Clean Water Act and the Endangered Species Act, the Mountain Valley Pipeline will be approved. So that's a picture of the Mountain Valley Pipeline, which has now been approved, notwithstanding the operator's failure to comply with environmental regulations. It's it's a, approved. The Grant Town Power Plant, I think, has been written about pretty extensively. It's it's uh, the Mansion family coal brokerage business provides the waste coal to the Grant Town Power Plant. So there's stories both. Uh, Scott Waldman from Politico has written about it a few times. Um, Jeff Goodell of Rolling Stone. Um, anyways, lots of stories about uh, sort of the the unique power purchase agreement associated with Grant Town that results in half a million dollars a year going to the Mansion Family Coal Brokerage business. Um, so the disconnect. I just want to talk about. Ask a quick question. Sure. In, yeah. In here is the uh, West Virginia <clears throat> Public Service Commission elected or appointed? Appointed. Okay. And appointed by um, Jim Justice, who's a Republican governor who made his money in, in the coal business. Um, so, I the, the book I spent a little bit talking about uh, a couple of the a couple of the commissioners. Uh, Bill Rainey um, is a commissioner now. He was president of the West Virginia Coal Association. He retired from the Coal Association and in 2020 in February 2021, and was promptly appointed to the Public Service Commission in August of 2021. I talk about Bill Rainey quite a bit in the book because he is frankly the, the person that I will credit for better or for worse for the whole Friends of Coal and this ingenious public relations strategy of um, basically getting West Virginians to embrace their coal, their coal heritage. That that's uh, I give Bill Rainey a lot of credit for being really, really good at what he did uh, representing the Coal Association in West Virginia. I just don't. You know whether he belongs on the PSC or not, but they're appointed by by the governor, and that's um, that's that's where we are. So what I want to talk about is the the disconnect, which I think is bad for for West Virginia going forward, because as you all I think are well aware, with the Inflation Reduction Act, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, um, lots of federal dollars are available to promote clean energy and decarbonize. But in West Virginia, we still have these policies clinging clinging to coal, I would say. So there's the Inflation Reduction Act. There's Senator Manchin right there. There's a fairly small group. we got Chuck Schumer. And, um, but this is when the, the Inflation Reduction Act was passed in August of 2022. And we're seeing all sorts of benefits right now in terms of the energy-related spending to address climate change, $369 billion. A couple of pieces that are huge for West Virginia are the prevailing wage because the wrap in West Virginia, well, these fossil fuel jobs pay so much more than the clean energy jobs. So in order to get the full benefit of the tax credits, there's this prevailing wage requirement, and that's this, the prevailing wages must be paid um, during construction of uh, of a project. So it helps deal with that just transition to make sure that these retraining of these fossil fuel workers are going to have opportunities that are for good paying jobs. There's an apprenticeship requirement that a certain percentage of your of your workforce 
needs to be in the in apprentice program. Again, it's part of that retraining of the fossil fuel workers. Again, this is the Inflation Reduction Act. I think Mansion deserves a lot of credit for these things being in there. Obviously, there are a lot of other people involved in, in crafting that piece of legislation. But in terms of things that really benefited West Virginia, this Inflation Reduction Act, these two elements of it. And there's a third one, the energy community, that if you're in, in a region that has a disproportionate negative impact due to a fossil fuel, um, a coal plant closing down, coal mine closing down, natural gas plant closing down, or it's a brownfield, or you just have chronic high unemployment, you basically, there's a 10% tax kicker. Um, and so it encourages additional investment. This is a, a map early on. It's not great. This is the basically Inflation Reduction Act. These are the energy communities. So it basically tells you, you know, if you're looking to invest around the country, this is where your dollar is going to go 10% further because if you're an energy community, and so it's a either brownfield, retired coal plant, closed coal mine. This is, I tried to blow that up. You can see pretty much the whole state of West Virginia is an energy community. So there's a lot of opportunity for wind, solar, um, low carbon resources, clean energy manufacturing, come to West Virginia and you'll get a 10% kicker as long and on top of the tax credits if you have a prevailing wage and um, and the apprenticeship piece, piece of it. And so there, there has been a lot of investment in West Virginia, but as I mentioned before, when you have the Public Service Commission telling the utilities to run the coal plants at their additional capacity factor, 69 to 70%, and you don't have any, any uh, rigorous integrated resource planning process that's going to require the utilities to integrate wind and solar if they're cheaper, you don't really have much room for those that wind and solar. If you want to build it in West Virginia and take advantage of those tax credits, you're going to be selling it into PJM. You're going to be taking the risk of, of whether you can um, beat the market claim price in in PJM. So even though we have these great federal policies promoting clean energy and providing lots of encouragement for doing it in West Virginia, you don't have the corresponding policies at the state level, which is a huge, a, a huge lost opportunity, really. Um, but that's that's the dynamics of the state. But I did want to, uh, on a favorable note, I call this a glimmer of hope, because um, these are some of the things that I worked on while I was still in the state that basically Legislators started getting the message that, that, look, your large employers, a lot of them have aggressive clean energy goals, corporate sustainability goals. They want access to renewable energy. If I come to West Virginia, can I get access to renewable energy? Well, no, we're 91% coal fire. Can I get access to low cost energy? Well, actually, no, our electricity prices have gone up five times the national average over the last 10 years because we doubled down on coal. Not a good story. So, but the legislators, I think, started hearing from the economic development folks in the state that we need to figure out how to respond to those demands. These are not demands placed on by the legislators or the government or, or Washington, D.C. These are the employers. These are the, are the job creators who say, if you want us to locate or expand in your state, you better give us access to green energy and low cost energy, clean energy. So in 2020, basically allowed the utilities to build these 50 megawatt solar arrays and basically earmark the output for commercial industrial customers. 2021, they finally legalized third-party power purchase agreements for, for rooftop solar. Basically, that's a financing mechanism that allows customers to avoid those upfront costs. Those were previously illegal in West Virginia. It really removes a huge barrier to, to rooftop solar that was legalized in 2021. And then in 2022, Berkshire Hathaway came along, a former client of mine when they acquired Pacific Corp, um, decided they wanted to put in a 200 megawatt um, renewable microgrid uh, with battery storage. And um, they, But they said the only, the only way we're going to do it is if we are exempt from PSC jurisdiction. We want to do whatever we want within our little microgrid, which is the uh, former uh, Brownfield in Jackson County. And the legislature passed that in a, in a special session in a single day that basically gave Berkshire Hathaway what it wanted. So now we're going to have a, a precision cast parts, which is another Berkshire Hathaway subsidiary is going to be um, building a manufacturing facility on that on that plant. So that, again, that was a response by, a, a, you know, obviously a highly respected um, clean energy developer in the country, Berkshire Hathaway Energy, bringing jobs to the state and and doing what it takes to overcome the regulatory barriers. If Berkshire Hathaway wants to build only if the PSC is not bothering them, then let's pass a bill that says they're exempt from PSC jurisdiction. So those are a, a few positive developments in addition to some of the things that have been happening in the state in response to the Inflation Reduction Act. Let me stop there and, and answer any questions, Carrie. Okay, thank you, Jamie. Thanks for that uh, yeah, informative whirlwind of background of, of West Virginia. 
So uh, while well, other people type in some more questions. Uh, I have, there's another question I can take a shot at here. Go, go uh, ahead. Brie, Brie de la Tour, do you have any hope that Western Union can recover from these changes? Um, I mean, I can say there were, there were some positive developments there at the end, because I do think the legislators are starting to get the message that, um, look, it's the job creators who are making these demands on us for clean energy and low cost energy. And we need to we need to meet those demands that that being ex being so heavily dependent upon coal has not been um, it put them, given a huge disadvantage in terms of competing for for jobs. I think the energy community, the energy community piece, um, Form Energy, which we're pretty familiar with here in Boston, but they have a long term energy storage um, technology that they're using. They're building a huge battery manufacturing plant in the northern panhandle. Of, of West Virginia, I think it's uh, it's based largely on the fact they can get a ten percent energy community tax credit. So I think there's um, there's some pretty there's some encouraging things happening in West Virginia. I think what's discouraging is Jim Justice, a coal baron, is still the governor. Those are still his appointees on the Public Service Commission who have strong fossil fuel backgrounds and um, and the rates continue to be to be set in a manner that really favors um coal production and that's and so they're missing this opportunity because i think with you know with all the with with all the incentives coming out of washington dc they could really uh leverage um and create some real opportunities but if you're requiring utilities to keep running coal to keep burning coal you don't create much room for those those solar and and, and wind installations that could that could help decarbonize the the electricity supply and also and also reduce rates. You're not you're not providing that that headroom. So we're just missing missing a huge opportunity. Um, so see if there's another yeah. right. I'm going to cheat and ask one question for myself before sure. we get to some others online. The um, example you gave of the Public Service Commission transferring, as you say, three merchant coal plants into the rate base sounds fairly unique to me is, is there other precedent of this happening or how much does this has this ever happened across anywhere in the country that you're aware of it's it's unprecedented i mean it's it's um and, and especially and, and this is one of the things that, that i got so motivated to, to write because i was following this very closely i actually testified in front of the public service commission on the on the last one because you had the you have the CEOs of both First Energy and AEP saying, we're losing our shirts with these coal plants in the competitive wholesale markets. We need to unload them because we can't have our shareholders bearing these losses. What are we going to do with them? And and you bring them to West Virginia and it's like, I mean, I think most of the states that I've ever practiced, practiced in front of, they would, have, they would have thrown those filings out. It's like, why is it going to be any better for the rate payers? These plants are losing money because they can't compete in the wholesale market. They're above the market clearing price. And we're just not going to take them, but they took them. Uh, in the case of one plant, they actually paid more than net book value, which is a huge anti. It's it's really contrary to standard rate making practices. But it's, it's like, and like I think most states were selling their coal plants for pennies on the dollar because they were they were out of the money, and and natural gas was so much cheaper, and then wind and solar became cheaper. But in West Virginia, they they doubled down on, it. and so it's resulted in in really rapidly increasing electricity prices, and also basically sucking all the air out of the room so there's no room to diversify into natural gas wind or solar or better yet energy efficiency it was all about all about burning more coal and, and it's a poor state it's a, it's a poor state to, it's a, you know i think it's still the second lowest per capita income i believe and it's just the people can't afford can't afford that we can't i i wrote a few op-ed pieces in the charleston gazette mail talking about about bailing out the coal industry on the backs of the west virginia ratepayers. it's just not fair and the ratepayers can't afford it but um as long as jim justice is the is the governor that's probably not going to change because he he got his he earned his fortune in the in the coal industry and he'll move on to the u.s senate presumably and 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 maybe some different personnel on the on the commission will make a difference right uh do you like to pick uh questions on the q a or have me read them to you elijah schuessler has a question of the changes allowing cheap renewable power to be purchased by your industry users result in even higher rates for ratepayers that's that's a really good question when all that was happening um because i spent a lot of time um working with like with the consumer advocate 
types, thinking about the general body of rate payers. And I thought, well, what's good, what's good for the job creators, what's good for all these high tech companies and West Virginia, it's not really high tech, it's Walmart, Procter and Gamble and Toyota are the three biggest employers, but they all had pretty aggressive corporate sustainability goals. And if they're able to pick and and they and lots of times it's not just for their image, that is actually the lower cost path. And so that's why they want access to renewable energy. So if they're able to pick off the renewable energy, um, then that kind of eases the, the demand for why can't we all get access to renewable energy? So that's a really good question because I do think I do think it probably did result in higher costs because you didn't have that political pressure coming to bear um, on behalf of the, uh, to, to accommodate the job creators, they're already accommodated by the fact they can get these deals and leaving the, the general body of ratepayers left with no access to renewable energy that the sort of the big dogs are getting. But I think that's an unfortunate dynamic, I think. What is the popular consensus of individuals say say as a false news? Um, that's from Fred Beach. Um, I gotta say, um, that's one of the reasons I spent so much time talking about the the culture of West Virginia because it, it is a source of great pride, and I think it's, it's you're almost not patriotic if you don't really advocate and and believe in in the coal industry. And I think I I mean the students I had at WVU I, I gotta say get it in terms of and a lot of them came from coal backgrounds. Their families, their fathers and grandfathers and uncles, um, but they get it that that's not the future. But I think there's still a lot of, um, you know, when Donald Trump came to the state in 2016 and said he's going to put a lot of coal miners back to work, and Jim Justice got elected as a Democrat in 2016 and switched to a Republican because he wanted to be um, Trump's guy in, in West Virginia, but he's saying all those things. And and so it's hard to talk about a transition, a necessary transition, when you have your political leaders saying there's no transition necessary because the coal jobs are coming back. And I think they might finally be getting the message that even after Trump dismantled a lot of the clean energy policies in the EPA, that the coal plants closed down around the country just as quickly in the, the Trump administration as they did during the Obama administration. So maybe maybe we were sold a bill of goods when we talked about the war on coal because it turns out the EPA really didn't have much to do with it at all. Maybe it actually was the economics of electricity generation with natural gas, wind, and solar. Um, Is there a specific community country in that similar rates? Maybe, maybe read it out uh, for the so audience that might be looking at the- Danny says, is there a specific community in the country on the edge of a similar fate that you think would most benefit from looking at West Virginia as an explanatory cautionary tale? If so, which one and why? Well, wow, that's a great. That's yeah. a great. Is West thing. Virginia the cautionary tale, or somebody else? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think Wyoming is very similar to West Virginia. They are fighting hard to keep their coal. You know, the Powder River Basin. They're the number one producer of coal. My former client, Pacific Corp, operates there. Um, they're being discouraged from shutting down coal plants, even though it's the even though that's where the economics would take them. And they're they're fighting hard. Um, Kentucky would have been there, but I think you had you had bipartisan leadership in Kentucky that says we need to. We need to move on. Um, I'm trying to think if there's any other. I mean, parts of parts of Virginia are that way, but no, I, I think I think West Virginia and, and um, Wyoming are are unique in terms of of having a hard time breaking away from breaking away from coal. Um, yeah, but I guess West Virginia. I mean, uh, Wyoming. As far as I know, they even. I think still, or the tax wind production. So in terms of extracting resources and using it as a tax base, coal and, and wind. And so that's kind of, you know, across the board. Equal there's a lot of, there's a lot of wind. There's yeah. a lot of wind in Wyoming. And I know um, Warren Buffett is thinking about building a nuclear plant in, in Wyoming. So I think they're, they're more of an energy state. There's actually uranium resources in my, and they're, they're much more of a across the board energy state than West Virginia, which we, even though it has a lot of natural gas, it's really a, a coal state. Uh, right. I might go back to my one question just because I'm, I'm, I'm curious about this transferring merchant plants into the rate base. Sort of how did that kind of work legally, I guess? Uh, was there a precedent? I mean, is, is there part of West Virginia that is not in PJM and they operate with a monopoly set of customers? Are they rate-based power plants, but they, they have to dispatch into the PJM market? 
and the customers are legislated to uh, pick up the tab of the losses uh, somehow? That's that's what's been happening is they're basically being dispatched, even though um, they're like must run. They're dispatched whether or not it makes economic sense or, or not. The way for rate making purposes is, is the rate payers are pretty much bearing 100% of the costs of those plants. And then to the extent you're able to sell into the wholesale market, you can credit back those revenues that you gain from selling into the wholesale markets are will be credited back to reduce your, your retail rates. But if you're not actually getting any of those, then you're basically selling at a loss because you're because the revenues you're getting back um, don't even cover the the cost of operating the plant. So it just contributes to to additional losses and and upward upward rate pressure. Uh, but, and it's you know the, the the competitive wholesale market doesn't lie. Those market clearing prices it's it's ruthlessly competitive. It, you, you're bidding in. Um, you're bidding in your your marginal cost of operation, and you're either above that market clearing price or you're not. And if you're not, you're um, you're out of the money, and um, you're operating a loss. And and they're able to AP and First Energy were able to just move those money losing plants into the regulator rate base. And and the PSC has its way based on its decisions from a couple of years ago. Those plants are going to be running through 2040 because that's the orders they've been given now is. Mountaineer Amos and Mitchell have all been told um, you will make the necessary improvements and environmental upgrades to enable these plants to continue running for another 16 years. So. Right. I suppose it's slightly similar, like, of course, different than when ERCOT, uh, you know, restructured and some places like us here in, in Austin and San Antonio, large municipal utilities still own, you know, it's a monopoly utility. They own power plants, but they they dispatch into the ERCOT market, yeah. uh, but they're not, in some sense, dispatching uh, on purpose at, at higher costs. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's it's much in a vertically integrated state like West Virginia. You you I mean, unlike the competitive states where it's restructured, like Massachusetts, New York, um, and you're really you're really at the mercy of your regulator. You need to, your regulator needs to be. Protecting the rate payer from from these practices are going to cause rates to go up. You're really depending upon that that function to be served be served by your by your regulator. And, yeah, it's it's there. It's definitely a pro coal bias. It's funny because uh, Charlotte Lane is the current chair of the commission, and of course now that I'm a commissioner, we ran into each other at at NARUC, the National Association of Regulatory Commissioners, we had a national conference out in Palm Springs in November. And, and I, I've known Charlotte for well, 13 years. And of course, she graciously congratulated me on my appointment. And then of course, she teases me about high, how high electricity prices are in Massachusetts, because they are. We're dependent upon, you know, we're dependent upon LNG. And so she teases them, you know, Jamie, your prices wouldn't be so high if you burn more coal. And kind of wink, wink, I said, Charlotte, that's just not going to happen in in Massachusetts. But thanks for that. Thanks for that advice. But she's she's a very gracious person, and uh, our paths will cross frequently. All right. Okay. Well, uh, thank you very much for this informative talk, and uh, congratulations sure. on your book. So this has been uh, Jamie Van Nostrand, uh, former Charles M. Love Jr. endowed professor at West Virginia College of Law. Thanks for joining us at the Energy Symposium. Thank you, Carrie.